Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Hamsa and I'm an incoming medical student starting medical school this summer. Now, if you're applying to medical school this cycle, chances are you've heard of the AAMC preview exam. It's a situational judgment test and more and more medical schools are now requiring you to take this exam in place of exams like Casper. Now, I took the preview exam last summer when I was applying through the whole medical school process and I actually ended up scoring 100th percentile on this exam. This exam is really designed to test you guys on real life scenarios you might face as a medical student, testing you on principles like ethics, professionalism, morality. Now, although this exam doesn't really make or break you getting into a medical school or not, it can definitely be a factor that helps boost you to an acceptance. Now, if you're also preparing to take the Casper exam, I also got a fourth quartile on that test and I made two videos, one breaking down the exam format and the other talking about the tips I used to get a hundredth percentile. So make sure to check those videos linked right up here. But today's video is all about the preview exam. So in this video, I'm gonna show you guys tips and tricks I use to score a hundredth percentile on preview. So let's get right into the video. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about the exam format. For the exam, you're gonna have about 31 scenarios that you need to be answering in 75 minutes. Now, one scenario is basically a paragraph of an introduction into what the issue really is at hand. So you're gonna read that paragraph, get an idea of what the situation is, and then you're gonna be answering around five to seven questions for each scenario. Now, each of these questions is basically a statement on what a possible solution is to the issue that you just read in the paragraph. And you're gonna have to rank these solutions on a four point scale. So first we have very ineffective. This basically just makes the situation worse or adds a new problem. We also have ineffective, which does little or nothing helpful, maybe even slightly harmful. We also have effective, which helps in a limited or partial way. And lastly, we have very effective, which significantly improves the situation or resolves the issue thoroughly. So let's just talk through a quick example so you guys kind of understand what the test format is. So one of the paragraphs you could be given for your scenario is that you're shadowing a doctor and you forget to wash your hands before you actually enter the patient's room and the doctor calls you out and says, hey, I noticed you didn't wash your hands. So one of the questions, like question number one, the statement might read, tell the doctor that you did and lie to them. Now, you're gonna have to rank this either as very ineffective, ineffective, effective, or very effective. Now, how scoring works for this exam is basically your grade is gonna be on a nine point scale. So you can score anywhere from a one all the way to a nine. Now, any score from a six to a nine is considered to be good. And any score from a seven to a nine is considered to be very competitive. So you wanna be aiming for around this range. Okay, so first let's dive into what makes an answer choice very ineffective. Now, very ineffective answers either make the situation worse, violate professionalism, or just miss the point entirely of what the solution should be. Okay, first let's talk about some of the clearest examples of when you should 100% choose very ineffective. The first one is definitely going to be lying. Always remember, honesty is the best policy and you should never lie in any situation. That's always gonna be very ineffective. So for example, in the example I gave earlier of you shadowing the doctor and lying about washing your hands, if you lied to that doctor and told the doctor, I did wash my hands, you might have not seen me. This is gonna be a very ineffective answer. So lying is always very ineffective. Another example of when you should always choose very ineffective is paying attention to key buzzwords. So for example, if the answer says telling versus asking, typically if you use the word telling in the context of telling a student, that is actually gonna be ineffective. But if you're using telling in the context of telling an authority figure, always, 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 it's going to be very ineffective. So keep that differentiation in your mind. If you're telling a student, it's gonna be ineffective, but if you're telling an authority figure, it's gonna be very ineffective. 
So obviously the third example, you might think that stereotypes are bad and you should never tell a stereotype out loud to a person or anything like that. And this is true, but also thinking it internally is also going to be very wrong. And if an answer choice ever says you can believe a stereotype, but just not say it out loud, this is still very ineffective. So make sure you choose that answer choice. And the last example I have is self-serving behavior that harms others in your group, especially if you're working in a team. If there's any answer choice or statement that implies that you're benefiting yourself, but indirectly or directly harming others in your group or team, this is always going to be a very ineffective answer. All right, now let's move on to what makes an answer ineffective. So ineffective answers are those answers that may sound okay at first, but they actually don't benefit the situation in any way or really affect it, good or bad. They don't really contribute anything to the issue at hand. The first example I have for you guys is basically making excuses. So in the hand washing incident I talked about earlier, if instead you reacted to the doctor who told you that you didn't wash your hands and you say, yes, I understand that I didn't wash my hands, but I was just tired. This is still gonna be an ineffective answer and not effective because although you did acknowledge what you did, you're not showing growth that you're actually gonna change and make sure this never happens again. The second example I have is something that might seem like it helps at first, but doesn't really contribute in a meaningful way. So for example, let's say you have a classmate that's constantly showing up late to your group meetings and you're working in a team to develop a group project and finish it on time. If one of the answer choices maybe says, oh, bring snacks to the next meeting to foster more team collaboration. Yeah, this might actually you know be a good thing for your group however it's not really contributing to the main issue at hand this is why it's ineffective because as i mentioned earlier ineffective answers may sound good at first but they really don't solve the root cause or any of the issues that the situation is getting across all right my third example is something that i call the half half rule so a lot of these scenarios might bring up conflicting tasks. Like for example, let's say you signed up for a volunteer position, but also your job is telling you to come in for a shift when you already plan to volunteer. Now you have to uphold you know, your integrity for both jobs because you committed to it. But again, here is where buzzwords come into play. We have saying versus requesting. So if you're saying, I can only do half of the volunteer shift and half of the work shift, then that is going to be an ineffective answer. But if you request that you do half of the volunteer shift and half of the work shift, then that could be an effective answer. All right, the next tip is actually doing someone else's job for them. So in a lot of teamwork scenarios, you might be given a prompt where a student isn't picking up their slack and doing their part of the group assignment. And you might think, okay, what if I just do their part for them? This is going to be ineffective because you're not helping the student being able to do their part or even understanding why they're unable to meet their requirements. So again, it might sound kind to help them out and do their part, but it's not really addressing any part of the issue at hand. And the issue is helping the student get back on track. And the last tip I have for this section is confronting peers. So remember I mentioned earlier in the very ineffective section, if you confront a peer with confrontational language, this is going to be an ineffective answer. But always, if you do the same thing to authority, that is always going to be very ineffective. Okay, now we've talked a lot about the bad answers, so let's move on to some positive answers. Let's talk what makes an answer effective. Effective answers address at least one part of the conflict or issue, although they might not address all the parts of it. They're respectful, calm, and tend to move things forward in some aspect. So the first example I have for this section is the half-half rule again. So remember I mentioned if you ask to split responsibility with conflicting tasks, that's gonna be an effective answer. But if you just tell or say that you're gonna do it without fostering that open conversation, that's an ineffective answer. My second tip is asking students for help. This is always going to be effective because asking for help is always what you should do when you're struggling with an issue or a task. But let's say you were to ask an authority figure instead, this would be a very effective answer because you're going to someone who kind of has a broader knowledge base and more in-depth solutions than maybe a student might have just because they have more experience. 
Okay, the third tip that I have for you guys is basically calling out someone's behavior when it's wrong, but not explaining why their behavior was necessarily wrong. So for example, let's say you have a student that's maybe saying some sexist ideologies like women can't work as hard as men. And let's say you call them out and you tell them, hey, your behavior was wrong and don't do it again. Yes, that is one step forward because you're telling that person that they were wrong and they shouldn't be speaking this, but you're not explaining why. Explaining why helps prevent the situation in the future and also fosters a sense of understanding between you and the person at hand so that they really understand why their behavior was wrong and how it can actually impact other people. Okay, and the last tip I have for this section for you guys is medical student responsibilities. Always, 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 medical student responsibilities, even if it is optional, always take precedent no matter what the issue at hand is so if you get an answer choice that basically sounds super good and really addresses the situation but it doesn't put precedent on your medical school responsibilities like studying for an exam for example you can't choose very effective so at the most it would be an effective answer okay now for the last section what makes a response very effective very effective solutions always maintain professionalism, but also solve the core issue, and in fact, all issues at hand, not just one, like the effective answers do. So for the first type of answer choice, always trying to address the root cause is going to be a very effective answer. So for example, let's say you have a student that has been falling behind in classes, and you know that they are falling behind because of personal life challenges. And let's say they come to confide in you that their grades have been falling, and they look to you for advice. An effective answer might be, for example, sitting down with them and having an open conversation to hopefully make sure that they're feeling good and in a mentally good space. This does address one part of the issue, so it would only be effective, but you're not helping the other part where the student mentioned they're falling behind in their classes. So a very effective answer might be acknowledging how they're feeling and talking through with them about it, but also connecting them with tutoring resources and maybe even therapy to help them get back on track. The second tip I have again is basically asking for help. Now I mentioned in the effective section that it's gonna be an effective answer if you reach out and ask a student for help. But if you reach out and ask an advisor or an authority figure for help, this is always going to be a very effective answer. So if you couldn't tell so far, there's definitely a pattern of basically anything related to student versus authority. The third tip I have is a response that kind of promotes learning and reflection. So I talked a little bit about this in the effective section when I said that telling a student that what they said is wrong if their behavior was incorrect is an effective answer, but to make it very effective, you need to foster that reflection and learning. So maybe asking a student, hey, did you consider how X, Y, and Z might have hurt this person? Things like that help foster that reflection and make it a very effective answer. And then the fourth tip I have is just supporting others appropriately. So for example, if you have a student that's being bullied or someone that is saying racist remarks or sexist remarks, definitely calling them out and also just supporting the person who had been targeted is always gonna be a very effective answer. And lastly, any response that follows ethical and moral guidelines is going to be very important. So if you have a student or someone who's just not following ethical guidelines, maybe they're making up data for a research project, then always following ethical guidelines and reporting it to the right authority if the student isn't willing to change is going to be very important. All right, now with these tips, you're ready to take the practice AAMC preview exams and implement all the things you have learned throughout this video. When you first start answering these questions, read the scenario and ask yourself if any of the solutions address any of the core issues at hand. If they don't, yours is always gonna be ineffective or very ineffective. And if they do address maybe one of the issues at least at hand, you know it's gonna be either effective or very effective. But other than that, that's it. These are the tips that I used to score in the 100th percentile on preview in less than a week. If you found this video helpful, make sure to give it a like and subscribe so you don't miss out on any other videos. And comment down below what tips you like the most and which ones you're gonna start implementing when you study for this exam. But you've got this pre-meds, you're almost there. I can't wait to see everything you accomplish on this journey. Anyways, I'll see you guys in the next video.